Welcome back to the program. I'm Ben Thompson. Now, the Middle East isn't known for its frank and open discussion, but the last few months have changed that. Whether it's organising protests on Facebook or discussing political change on Twitter, many people here across the Arab world have found a voice through social media. But unable to stop that flow of information, how can governments and businesses here turn this newfound freedom of expression to their advantage? It's a question Stephanie Hancock put to a special panel of guests in this week's summer debate. I think governments in this part of the world, in the Arab world in general, have been accustomed to being uh, control freaks. And suddenly there's this explosion of uh, sources of information online. And there's a critical mass of users. Most of them are young people, 70% of them. Uh, and as well, 70% of the population in the region almost is uh, under 30 years old. Um, so they are uh, not used to it. They're afraid uh, of this new phenomena. I think governments, as soon as they realize that censorship in the old form is dead uh, and try to figure out a way to adapt, it will be easier and less costly for everybody. Last year, there was this whole debate when Ramadan was about to hit the beginning of the school year in the UAE. And there was a debate about whether the UAE should start the school before or after Ramadan. And basically, Sheikh Hamad took it to Facebook and he just posted and said, what do you guys think? What he gained in that ex exercise, I mean, was a lot more than the issue itself. Do you think that, that, that governments are changing quickly enough, adapting, as, as Fadi says they need to? Do you think they're changing quickly enough? And how do you think local people react to being addressed in a different way by their governments? Do you think they like it? It's too kind to say it in a different way. I mean, it's just how do I feel about being addressed to begin with? I mean, they have not been addressed until now. And sometimes people just want to just want to share their point of view. And you know, with that story of the of the break in, uh, in, in uh, so when school started in Ramadan, everyone was agreed that it was nice that they got their word in. It was almost like voting on something. It was really you know. It was like a mini vote on something. And I think in that sense, people do want to share. And I think um, the reason why it's also more uh, urgent is the general performance of Arab countries in general. Things are not, things are just not working. The system is broken. You need all your stakeholders. You need the society. You need the intelligentsia. You need the businesses. And you need the government. I think everybody's learning the hard way in Egypt now how everybody needs to come together to pull a country. Tunisia as well. And I think. The, 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 the idea is that we're all stakeholders in a system. And if we're going to try to exclude one part because we believe that they're going to disagree with us, that's just a time bomb. You mentioned that idea of the, the mini votes. Do we think that social media can help drive democratic reform? I don't. I, I think democratic reform is, is an ideology. It's a, it's a, it's a way of thinking. Um, I don't think the platform dictates that. I think that's a cultural thing, and that's something that societies evolve with. Um, it, that's not what social media does. It simply is a platform for people to communicate. Uh, it doesn't form ideologies. But I think what it does is that it, expl it, ex it, 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 um, it allows you to see points of view that you would not see in your own kind of circle, social circle in real life. So you have a lot of people who are really liberal who are realizing that, you know, that there are people with very different points of views, very conservative point of views on Twitter. And they battle it out and they disagree and then they agree and they find common ground. And I think that is very healthy because you start realizing that your social circle really isn't representative of the diversity that you have in your country or your business community. And I think that's good. I don't think that's going to make you, you know, become, prepare you for democracy, but I think it definitely buffers you uh, or allows you to go into this kind of induction phase of realizing, okay, if I really want democracy, I'm going to have to fight it out with about seven or eight other groups that have very, very different views. It breaks the silos in society for the users of social media. And with the growth of user base, it will ha you will have enough people in society that are understanding of the different point of views and able to communicate and discuss issues that weren't, they didn't know that exist in, in society. Do we think that's the, one of the most exciting aspects of it then for businesses? I don't think businesses are excited about the f aspect that they actually can find out what their clients want. I think for them they realize that that's a can of worms and that it could make life very difficult in the short term. I think the sooner they accept that, the sooner they realize that their clients are no longer kind of three or four, you know, demographics, and that's it, and that's how you slice them. Um, I think the the sooner they'll be they'll be able to evolve. So you think there's a, a, neg think a real negative impact? I just think it makes it more difficult because basically everyone is an individual, everyone's a demographic. 
I am not like Fadi. I do not want to be segmented like Fadi. I am my own client, you know? I think companies entering Facebook have to realize that it's not something that, that is like the revolution that they're doing. It's just something that they have to do. Do you agree, Mohammed? Uh, no, actually, I want to I address <laughs> two things that I don't agree with. Um, uh, first, in terms of exposure. Exposure is also something that is um, controlled by the individual as well. And you can see that not working very well, for example, if you track uh, things like Bahrain, where you have two very distinct groups and they don't really interact with one another. And whenever there's interaction, it's very hostile. Uh, so there isn't really a dialogue going on between two groups. Uh, even no, but I'm not saying dialogue, but just people realize that there is a very opposing view. I think that's it, healthy. It, it does expose you to, the, to that it exists, that, that you may not that think it exists, that but 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 the silo will still exist. And I think there's a there's a uh, short-term exposure, and then silos will be created again. Um, I don't think those silos will go away. But I think that's human nature, right? I mean, we, we even awesome. before before the, before social media. I mean, you go to debates and you meet people who are you know who have very opposing views, you know, and then after a while you you, you say, think right, they might not exist. No, no, you just say, all right, that's your thing. I don't right. want to come to these kind of debates anymore. Fair enough. Because you expose. Um, when it comes to businesses, uh, I, I certainly don't agree, and that hasn't been our experience. Yeah. To them, this is this is a dream come true because you're you're essentially tapping into the to the to the minds of consumers. For marketing departments, that is the most beautiful thing that has ever happened, because now I can I can segment, I can I can I can listen, I can study, and conduct research without even having to go talk to anyone, and they are giving me all this information without asking me for anything back. And marketers love it. Now what they do with it is a whole different story, but I don't think they're scared of it. I think, I think certain companies are scared of how, what they do, what they need to do in terms of their representation of themselves there. But in terms of listening to the conversation, that conversations are happening, that's really exciting stuff. Something that I would like to sort of end on really, a sort of final thought perhaps from each of you about the, the dangers of, of information. There's a presumption that more information is always a good thing. There's lots of positives, of course, but what are the things we need to be careful of? I think I'm, I'm going to have to steal Michal's, uh, because I think he just put it so, so eloquently, uh, and that if you're sticking with uh, the idea that you are going to be in full control of the message, uh, it's not going to work. So you need to understand that that you need to adapt and there is an ongoing conversation and it's not your message to the world. Whether you're a business or a government, it doesn't matter. Howdy? We are at a stage where uh, this new phenomenon is totally unregulated and uh, everybody is, uh, it's, it's, it's chaotic in a way uh, and that creates opportunities and risks, yes. So the risks will be reputational to some entities, to some businesses, to some governments but the opportunities will be uh, there for businesses and governments who will be able to understand that this is uh, a way to deal with the new phenomenon, to, to communicate with the people and build on that information. Uh, it's still evolving, so we'll have to see. The, the issue of, of, of accuracy and how do you believe someone, I mean, I think that's an age-old issue. It's been an issue with print, it's been an issue with television, with radio, with a lot of... And it's a question of reputation. And as you build your, as you become reputable, as you cite your, your, your sources for the information that you provide, I think, you know, people will, uh, will, be, will, you know, will believe, will, will, you know, will develop a relationship with you. So I think that's an issue that will sort itself out. And that way social media is another tool, just like any other tool of communication that we've had before. And that's that. Stephanie Hancock there with this week's special debate. Now next week we'll have another one for you looking at the volatile price of oil and what impact that has on the economies of this region. But before we go, here's a quick look at how the region's markets finished. And don't forget, we'd love to hear from you. As always, our email address is middleeastbiz at bbc.co.uk. You can keep up to date with us too during the week at Twitter and Facebook. The details are there on the screen. But until then, from me, Ben Thompson, and the rest of the team, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.